Hey, this is John with Two Moves Home Inspections and welcome to the June 2021 in-service training. Thanks for joining us at the in-service training. And what I'd like to say is that if this is your first time joining us, make sure that you're putting the speed at 2X so that way you can get through it as quickly as possible. But we do have a lot of really good content that we'd like to get through and there is quite a bit of it to get through. Now, if you've been here before, you probably know that every once in a while I get on a soapbox and so on and so forth. And so this is really no exception. Right now, uh, I'm about to stand on a soapbox and I am heated. I'm, I'm really upset and annoyed. And the reason that I'm upset and annoyed is because we had uh, an inspection where I went to and I'm talking to this lady and she's the seller of the house. And I'm like, I'll be back in two days to pick up the radon. And she's like, well, why will you be back in two days? And I said, I'll be back in two days because two days is how long you need to have radon in a house to make sure you get adequate testing. She's like, oh, well, I just, I just got a house home inspected and we didn't have it for two days. I'm like, oh, well, that's, that's weird. Tell me more. And so she told me some more. And the more she told me, the more upset that I got. So anyway, I'm, I'm pretty heated. And what happened was that there was a home inspector who charged the exact same amount of money that we charge. And we'll explain why that's a little silly uh, in the future. And they charged the exact same amount of money that we charged. And their test was one hour and eight minutes long. And that is wrong for a lot of reasons. But additionally, they did mention what their testing apparatus was or what their testing device was. And that is a joke. So let's, uh, without further ado, let's take a look here. All right, so this home inspector, you know, did some internet searches, went on the Googles and found that on Amazon, you can get this thing for $174. All right, so you have $174 that you can buy this radon detector for. Great, and how much are they charging their customers every time that they deploy it? Oh, $150. Okay, cool, cool, cool. But that's because they're coming back. Oh, no, they're not coming back. They're just doing a one hour long test. Okay, well, fine. But anyway, if I was purchasing something, I wouldn't necessarily just trust what's on Amazon. I would probably do a little bit more research. And so one of the places that I would go for research is I'd actually go to the manufacturer's webpage. And on the manufacturer's webpage, as a home inspector, the very first thing that I'd see is, well, the very first thing I would see is that it says homeowner. It is for the homeowner. It is not for a professional. It is not for a home inspector. It is not designed for anybody other than the homeowner. And why would this be Why would this be designed for a homeowner? Because the homeowner will deploy it in their house. They will let it sit and they will get week long, month long, year long averages to really have a good idea of how much radon is inside their house. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So if if that means that they can do that, then it must be extremely accurate, right? So let's let's head down here and take a look at our sensitivity. So if we take a look at our sensitivity, here we are. Oh, and and what does that sense what was was that say right there? Oh, it says 10 times less sensitive than the devices that we use. Okay. All right, that's fine. That's fine. Well, let's just take a look at our devices real quick. All right, so we have our devices and our devices whenever we first bought them were $1500. And now you can see that these devices are 1299. All right, 1299 for a device. That's really not that bad. So one radon detector 1299. Well, the thing is that in addition to that 1299 Every year, you have to pay $150 um, just to have it serviced, basically to have it recertified that what it thinks it's detecting is actually accurate. So every year, it has to be recertified for $150 plus shipping. All right, cool. Well, you know, if you only have one, then that's no big, oh wait, we have six right now and we're buying more. Okay, so we have six and we're buying more. And so right now we're well over $10,000 worth of total investment on our radon detectors. And so we have about $10,000 worth of investment in our radon detectors. We have 10 times the accuracy that this other radon detector has. And, and here's, here's another thing that just really gets me is that on this particular radon detector that we have right here, what, what you'll see is that we have four sensors. And so we have four sensors on this radon detector. And so this other radon detector has one sensor. And why is that important? Well, because the EPA has guidelines that says that if you're going to be using passive detection such as this, that you need to have a minimum of two. You need to have two sensors. So we have two sets of uh, sensors running in parallel and then they come together and they create an average. And that gives us a very, very accurate idea of how much radon there is. So we have more sensors, more accuracy. So there's going to be less false positives, less issues, less whatever. Okay, cool. So that all seems really good. Um, and then if we go ahead and we say, okay, well, how much are you charging, John? How, mu how much is Two Moose Home Inspections charging? Oh, we're charging 150. Well, same as that guy. Okay, so you're telling me that because we have because we have 10 times the accuracy and we've spent $10,000 on our equipment, it's okay for us to spend 100 and uh, charge $150 for an inspection? And I'm saying, yeah. Heck yeah, that's a steal. And why is that a steal? The reason why is because not only do we leave that detector there for 48 hours, but we go all the way back to the house to pick it up. So 
we have, let's say we go to Fair Play, because we do a lot of radon detection in Fair Play. If you don't know the geography, Silverthorn to Fair Play is one hour. So it's an hour there and back in order to do our home inspection. Then it's an hour there and back in order for us to pick up the radon detector. So we're talking four hours of driving and we get your radon results. Now, 48 hours, John, wouldn't it just be easier to do while you're there at the home inspection, one hour and eight minutes? It's also very, very concerning that it was one hour and eight minutes because the very first thing that we should do is maybe set up the radon detector, you know, get water samples, do all these ancillary services, and then jump into the home inspection. So does this mean that, that he did an entire home inspection? in one hour and eight minutes or something close to that, that, that seems a little silly um, because that's not nearly long enough to do a home inspection. Maybe for like a small 400 square foot condo, maybe, but even that's pushing it. So, all right, so we have this guy and he's leaving a radon detector there for an hour and eight minutes while he's there. And then he just takes it with him. He doesn't come back. He doesn't do whatever. He doesn't do the 48 hours. But John, it would be so much easier to just do the one hour and eight minutes. And you're right. So that brings me to my next point. The next point is the EPA has guidelines. And why does the EPA have guidelines? The EPA has guidelines because radon is the number two killer uh, with lung cancer. Number two cause of lung cancer in the United States second only to smoking tobacco. So you're telling me that people die and have poor quality of life because of radon. And the answer is yes. So that's why the EPA has set an EPA action level of 4.0 pictocuries per liter. So that way, anything above 4.0 pictocuries per liter means that we need to do something. That is our action level. Something has to happen. Some type of radon mitigation has to occur. And there's no such thing as a safe level of radon. There's no such thing. Um, honestly, the World Health Organization says two pictocuries per liter is about as high as they're willing to go. All right, cool, cool, cool. So 48 hour test, well, what's, what's the same? While deployment periods should optimally collect at least 48 hours of valid sampling time, deployment periods are required to be not less than 46 hours. The EPA is saying not less than 46 hours. So I'm guessing that one hour and eight minutes is probably less probably less than 46 hours. Okay, all right, well, time out. Hold on, there's there's some more. So basically what it says is that you should do this in 24 hour increments. So all of this should be done in 24 hour increments, meaning that if I decide to do a three day test, then it should be three days worth of hours. So that would mean that I would take my 24 hour test. I would then go to my 48 hour test. I then go to my 72 hour test and I move on and on and on and on and on. And so you do this in one day increments. And the reason why is because that radon changes. It fluctuates. You have, um, you have the increase and decrease of, of radon levels um, from day to day. And so from day to day, from minute to minute, hour to hour. And what happens is based off of the atmospheric pressure, based off of um, the temperature, humidity, based off of pre precipitation events, and based off of what's going on in the house, those radon levels will fluctuate. And so it's very important that we do at least a full day extra if we're gonna do more than the 48 hour uh, test. We don't wanna have any weird numbers. So then where do we get the one hour and eight minutes? Because whenever you look at that device, that device takes it at 10 minute intervals. Uh, intervals, sorry, so 10 minute intervals. So that means that that device only did one hour worth of testing and that eight minutes psh, doesn't even count. May as well just been a one hour long test. And on that test, um, they scored a 3.7 pictocuries per liter. 3.7 pictocuries per liter while he's opening and closing all the windows, opening and closing all the doors, turning on the ceiling fans, running the HVAC, doing all these things that are not valid sampling time. What is valid sampling time? Leaving the house alone and not messing with anything. So while he's walking through the house, which can cause radon to plate onto you, while you have the ceiling fans going, which can cause radon to plate or stick onto the walls, while you're running the HVAC system, while you have the windows and doors completely open, letting all the radon escape, and also reducing the pressure in the house, so, I mean, well, equalizing the pressure in the house, so now you don't have an area of low pressure where radon is coming in. I mean, like, you, you gotta be kidding me. You gotta be absolutely kidding me. I hope that this guy is just ignorant and that he has no idea what it is that he's doing, but yet he's charging people $150. I really hope that this guy's just ignorant because if he's some kind of scoundrel that's just going around charging people money and knowing what he's doing and what he's doing is putting people at risk, that, that is unforgivable. That is just completely unforgivable. And I know that I'm so heated, but here, here's why I'm heated. As an adult, I have been in houses that have high levels of radon. As an adult, my best friend's house, my, my mom's house, my sister's house, whoever's house probably has high levels of radon. As an adult, it's not great for me, but it's not the worst. Do you know why? Because my lungs are not developing because I am not growing at such a rate because what happens with radon is you breathe it in and then whenever it's inside of your lungs, that alpha particle gets shot off. And whenever that alpha particle gets shot off, what it does is it actually punches out a section of the DNA in one of your cells. Now, hopefully that cell will die 
Okay, well, if that cell dies, then of course that can cause issues and cause cancer and cause whatever. But if it punches out a part of that DNA and the cell doesn't die, and now is replicating with a messed up DNA chain, then you're gonna have a lot of lung related ailments. And as a small child who is replicating so quickly, who is growing so fast, the people at most risk are infants and toddlers. And for somebody to go around saying that they are doing something and making sure that somebody is safe whenever infants and toddlers are involved, and they're just pulling the wool over people's eyes, I just, I can't even, I am, I am so heated right now. And then, oh, well, John, it's just because he's making more margin than you. He's making more money than you. He's your competitor. I don't care. I honestly don't care. I could make $0 on radon, but the thing is I have to pay for my equipment. I could make $0 on radon and I would do it because that is worth it to make sure people are safe. But if you're going to come in with some Mickey Mouse operation, you know, pretending that, you know, you just bought this toy on Amazon and that you're telling these people that they're safe with their small children, unforgivable, absolutely unforgivable. It, it just makes me so upset. I really hope that this person is just ignorant and that they aren't just a scoundrel. I just, I just really, really hope so. And I know that I'm heated and I know that maybe this is the wrong form in the wrong place, but it's important for my inspectors during our, our inspection um, training, during our in-service training, that they're aware that what they do with radon is so important because it is the lives of the people that, that trust us moving forward. They might not notice an issue for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, but if they develop lung cancer and we told them, oh, it was perfectly safe for you to be in your house. And I didn't have a, a machine that could be calibrated. I didn't have a machine that had the minimum number of sensors that the EPA said. I wasn't doing the minimum EPA uh, length of testing that the EPA says as a minimum. I, I was using a device that has tenfold less accuracy than any other device. And I'm charging you money and I'm saying that I'm keeping you and your family safe. I just, I can't, and I'm sorry. A little bit heated, but hey, how about this? Let's just let's just move on from this and say, if you want to know who the person is, I'll never tell you. I will never tell you. What I'll tell you is that they operate in the same area that we operate. And what, what I'll tell you is, if you want to know, I, I will not tell you because that is up to them to change their business practices. I will not hurt their business. I will not do anything negative towards them. If they ever hear about this or, or hear this story, they know exactly who they are. I just really hope that that individual changes their ways and becomes educated on why it is so important to test for radon in houses. So with that out of the way, thank you for listening to me on my soapbox. You know I always get heated. Um, let's move forward. Let's take a look at some defects. Let's jump back over to Notion and uh, let's start things off right. All right, so first things first. We have a shower door enclosure. The glass is uh, at risk. So basically, whenever we have these doors, they open up. And whenever they open up, if they could strike something, well, then um, the glass could shatter. And most of this glass is all, well, all this glass is tempered glass. So it's not a big deal, but we just don't want the glass to break because those doors are really, really expensive. So easy fix, just move, um, move the towel rack and then you're good to go. So this one right here, this dishwasher is mounted improperly. Um, if I could play this video for you, then what you would see is that that dishwasher is not mounted to the countertop. And so because of that, you can pull the handle and basically just pull out the entire dishwasher. This is also bad because the dishwasher is vibrating. Easy fixes, super duper easy fixes. So this house, we normally don't call out furniture issues because, you know, furniture. Um, but this house is really interesting. Um, I, I was walking by the furniture and just barely, barely tapped it. And the furniture just started rocking back and forth. And it's because all the screws are loose, but it was all the chairs, the tables, whatever. And they were going to use this as a rental property. So again, if you're just like, okay, I'm going to buy the house. It's already ready. Turnkey, good to go. Let's get this rental doing what it's supposed to do. And you don't know that all of your furniture is on the verge of falling down. If it's predictable, it's preventable. If you can predict that a, that a person after a long day of skiing is going to just sit down right at that table. And whenever they sit down at that table, uh, everything just collapses around them. Well, there's going to be a lawsuit and you better believe it's going to be more expensive than tightening up all those screws. And so the reason we put this in here, we normally don't even worry about furniture, but it's just one of those things as we talk again about health safety. I, I've, it was a joke. I've never seen uh, a table that could just move back and forth as freely and chairs as freely as this. It was pretty wild. So next thing's next, uh, extended strike plate. So, um, if we take a look, you know, up over there, uh, you can see on the wood that there's like a, a little bit of like a dark section. And that dark section on the wood is where the latching mechanism actually rubs up against the wood. Now they have these elongated strike plates um, that will basically protect that wood and make sure that, that you don't have any issues. So the, the real issue is not closing the door. The issue is opening the door because on, on one side, 
it is very smooth. And so as it comes, as it comes through things, it just very smoothly is going to close the door. But the problem is, is that you have a square edge on the other side. So as you try to open up the door, then that is going to potentially catch and the door will not open because it can catch on that wood. And so we want that strike plate to make sure that the operation is you turn the handle, pull and release the handle and you can just keep pulling and the door will open as intended. So we just wanna make sure that all doors operate the exact same way because in a fire emergency, we wanna make sure that whenever somebody has an expectation of turn, pull, release, throw the door, that the door actually does what it's supposed to do. And that would not be the case with this because over time um, without a strike plate, then that wood will get damaged and the wood will actually uh, bind up against that door's latching mechanism. So just easy peasy things. So missing weatherproof covers. So um, what you can see is right here uh, up above me, right there, is that we have some electrical outlets that are underneath the deck that are not protected for uh, any kind of weather. So they have these these cases or covers that you can plug in the electrical, uh, plug in the plug into the electrical outlet. And then that cover allows you to keep that plugged in all throughout the winter, no matter what rain or snow or whatever event comes on, then we are not going to get water introduced into those areas. Um, luckily, these are GFCI protected, so we are good to go. Um, but just one of those things, easy little thing. So gurgling, here's an interesting thing about gurgling. Gurgling is not great. And so this particular sink um, was gurgling. And why was it gurgling? Well, because we didn't have adequate venting. And so what does that mean? Well, if you take a straw and you take that straw and then you dip it into water and you put your finger on top of the straw, you can actually lift that water up, take it somewhere else and then release that water. And whenever you release that water, then the water is able to go down the pipe. And so same thing here. The reason this is gurgling is because we are not able, and because of the uh, the way that the P-trap works, is that air a column of air is not able to freely flow down with that water. And so because of that, it's kind of stopping the water and then an air bubble comes and releases the water, then it stops the water, air bubble comes, releases the water. So underneath here, there should have been an air admittance valve into that pipe. And that air admittance valve would basically allow uh, for any air that um, needs to come in to come in without allowing water to go out. And the, the problem is that a lot of times on kitchen islands, there is no actual uh, vent pipe that goes up into the atmosphere. And so that may be the only option that they have. But whenever you have this gurgling sink, that's one, very annoying, but two, it does require some additional work and probably a plumber to install an air admittance valve. So just one of those things to think about. All right, pH concentrate neutralizer uh, not present. So basically, whenever you have these high efficiency um, boilers, what happens is these high efficiency boilers are going to produce condensate and that condensate is uh, going to be slightly acidic uh, and and not great for your pipes, not great for anything. And so this pH neutralizer basically brings it right back um, to, to be more alkaline or to be right in the center of the pH chart, right at like a seven. And so then what that does is that prolongs the life of your pipes. And if you are on a septic system, it makes sure that all that good bacteria that's inside of that septic system that's breaking down those solids and doing the things it needs done um, does not get killed just by the condensate um, that is there. So we're talking like a $30 uh, inline filter kind of thing that basically the condensate goes through a couple of like little things that look like rocks, and then it goes the rest of the way down the drain. And that you replace, you know, once a year. So 30 bucks a year, no big deal. Just a good thing to know about. So here's an interesting thing. Whenever we were talking about people that that I am less than pleased with, whenever I go into a house and there's just something very awkwardly placed somewhere, you, you, you go to enough houses and you just kind of know that, huh, that that shouldn't be that way. That's that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's just weird that this is here. Why do they have this leaned up against that? Or why do they have this thing over here? Why is this all by itself? And awkwardly in the middle of the room was this hideous um, chair. And and underneath this chair, uh, which is difficult to see, but there was all of this like ink. Uh, just somebody had a Sharpie or a marker, or maybe a dog was chewing on a marker on the floor that they weren't supposed to have. And the carpet was destroyed and it looked like permanent and it didn't look like it was something that could be fixed. So in an attempt to sell this house, they also tried to obscure our ability to notice that the carpet needed to be replaced. And it's just, it's, I understand why it is that people do the things that they do. However, that doesn't make what they do correct. And it's just one of those things that if you have a messed up carpet, then just say, hey man, I got a messed up carpet. I'm not gonna replace it. But just so you know, there's a messed up carpet. You, you have no obligation to replace it, none at all. You just have to let them know, the carpet's messed up, I'm not coming down on price, sorry. But instead, what we have here is 
Oh yeah, the carpet, uh, yeah, it is messed up. Oh, and did I try to hide that from you? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 I totally, I totally tried to hide that from you. Oh, and are you worried that I'm hiding other things from you? Oh yeah, no, 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 yeah, our trust is completely gone. Yeah, so now this whole transaction, all the power and control has just gone to the buyer because you lost all that trust. And so as a seller, man, if you just own up to it, if you do a pre-inspection, if you do a pre-listing inspection, so if you call Two Moose Home Inspections and you say, hey, come and do a pre-listing inspection, we'd be like, all right, let's go do a pre-listing inspection. We will make you a laundry list of everything that is wrong with the house that could be repaired, that could be fixed, that could be whatever. And then you take that house, you put it on the market, you say, hey, here are all the things that are messed up and we aren't doing anything about it. Or here are all the things that are messed up and we have fixed these 10 items and we aren't gonna do anything about the others. So you know what it is coming into it. Let's not waste anybody's time. Do you want the house? Yes or no? Let's move forward or we'll find another buyer. And my gosh, is that so much better whenever somebody comes to a transaction with integrity? Really, really love it, really love it. Now, if accidentally they put this um, ever so perfectly on top of this damaged rug in the middle of the, the room and that's just where they like to sit, sure. But th this, was, this was on purpose, guaranteed. So next thing's next, abandoned con uh, connections for laundry. So um, the main thing is it would be really great to put caps on top of the hot and cold water. Um, so these caps that go on um, basically would just prevent that if that valve were to fail, you will not flood your house. And so just put two caps on it. Uh, we're talking a dollar per cap. So that's $2. And then we also wanna put a cap on our drain line. Now, the reason we wanna cap the drain line, this is more or less the bigger issue is because inside of the P-trap at the bottom of that drain line, what you'll find is that there is water in that P-trap. Now, if that water uh, evaporates, not if, when. When that water evaporates because you are not doing laundry, then what's going to occur is that we are going to um, basically have that evaporate so we no longer have a seal, and then all the sewer gases are then going to come up and into your house. All right, so we got all these sewer gases coming up into our house. Is that a problem? Well, aside from the smell, yeah. Uh, it also could be an issue where there could be a combustion if we had excessive levels of methane or whatever it may be. And so again, a, a cheap little, you know, maybe $2 cap, put that $2 cap on there and then you don't have to worry about any sewer gases or any issues, anything entering your house that shouldn't be entering your house. And, and it's just the safest way to take care of business. So easy health safety thing um, that is just super minor. All right, irregular noise from a ventilation fan. So basically, if your fan's making a whole bunch of noise, well, that's that's not great because that means that your fan is at the end of its life. And if it's at the end of its life, it could just be that it has dust. It could just be that there's a bad bearing. It could be a million different things. It could be that a bird made a nest inside of the ventilation uh, duct. And that, of course, would be bad as well. So whenever the fan is making a noise, it's letting you know that there's an issue. And so we just need to address the issue. So moving on from there, um, the paint was damaged on some of these walls and stuff. And so this right here is actually a chimney on top of a roof. And the interesting thing about uh, about this is that you are supposed to have uh, several inches of space between the roof surface and uh, the wood and other um, cladding uh, that you put onto a house. And so then what you'll see is that you can tell that the end grain, you know, which wood is always thirsty, even after death, um, it's like a vampire. And so that wood just is sucking in all of that water. Whenever it's sucking in that water, well, in order to suck in the water, it has to displace something. So what is it displacing? It's displacing the paint. And so we just wanted to make sure that there is, you know, it'd be nice to have a six inch gap, but honestly, if there's just even a two inch gap, it's just so we don't have direct contact. So that way the wood is given a chance to dry out and then we don't have any of the issues that we otherwise would have. So forced entry. Let's talk about this forced entry. So basically somebody booted the door. Um, it could be, you know, that there, that there was a, a, a crime that was committed. It could be that there was somebody angry at somebody else. It could be a, bro uh, you know, like little brother and sister or siblings, let's just say that siblings that are playing a game and one sibling closes the door as the other one is running towards the door and the door latches right whenever uh, the other kid makes contact with the door. And then we have damage to the, to the door right here. Well, the problem with this is that I'm not worried about, well, what are the crime statistics in this area? You know, you should know the crime statistics in your area. You should do the work before you purchase a house to understand what the neighborhood is. You should walk around the neighborhood. You should understand a lot about the house. That is not for the home inspector to tell you, and it's also not for the realtor to tell you. That is something that you have to decide based off of what your personal concerns are. So we are not worried about crime statistics. What we are worried about is overall security. So because the door jam has been damaged and it could even be that the two by fours inside the wall have been damaged because of that what we really need to be mindful of is that if somebody were to push on this door 
the door would, would basically break or release inward much more easily than it otherwise would. Now, if we were in a hurricane area, that would be a big issue. We're not. So basically, um, this is just one of those things that the quick fix would be to take, instead of the standard size screws, get extended screws that may be three inch screws, that may be six inch screws, and make sure that all the hardware that's installed is adequately secured into the frame. Um, and again, does it matter? No, it doesn't really matter, but it's just one of those things that I think that a person should always be safe inside of their house. And so therefore I think that's just a nice, easy thing to do. All right. So this one here, you can't really tell, but this is water and the overflow valve, uh, or overflow, um, drain where in a sink basin. So here, here's your sink basin. There is a drain where water can then go down. And in this particular one, it was not working. So it could be clogged, um, at the very bottom could be clogged at the top. Uh, it could be the type of um, drain system uh, or stopper that was installed. So one of those uh, pop stoppers, you know, you push down, it goes click, click, and then it stays in place and you press down, it goes click, click, and it releases. Those types of stoppers sometimes uh, are going to block the overflow port from being able to come back into the main drain. And so it could be as simple as something like that. But the main thing to keep in mind is that if you think that the, that the sink is not going to overflow, you are mistaken because the sink is going to overflow if you let it overflow. And so if you think that it's important to you to make sure that you have um, an overflow preventer, then I would say, yeah, go for it. So in this sink, um, the basin is cracked. And this was really interesting because you could actually shine the flashlight underneath and really see those cracks. And so what happens is that as that fills up with water, then the pressure allows those cracks to open. And whenever it doesn't have water, well, then the cracks are then closed. And so we just want to prevent leaking at any opportunity possible. All right. So this, this one's pretty wild. So th this um, SDR35, at the time uh, that this sewer scope was, that this sewer was installed, um, I'm pretty sure that somebody backfilled it with some pretty heavy rock uh, or something like that. Instead of backfilling it with a, either a sand or some type of soft um, uh, material, because if you backfill it with rock and then you take your tamper over top of it, then that tamper is basically just gonna pound that rock right into the pipe until the pipe breaks. So if we take a look here, uh, it's pretty evident, um, you know, you just have to use your eyes and look right over here that, that this section up here is, that that's exposed rock and dirt. And so if we see how bad that crack is, that that's a pretty considerably bad crack. Here's, here's another section um, just a little bit further beyond that. And look at how that crack has actually cracked half of that entire pipe. So now we have the ability for water to exit the pipe. And we also have the ability for roots to come into the pipe and block up the pipe. Um, and then if we look here at 20 feet, um, there's also another rock that was pushed through and you can start to see the roots that are starting to grow. All right. So what does this mean? Well, there are two, there are two options here. One is you can monitor it and just make sure it doesn't get any worse, which this is probably original to whenever it was first installed. So this might be as bad as it gets. However, uh, if roots start to grow or other things like that, then you're going to have yourself an issue. Um, or the other option is you can repair it. And obviously repairing it is going to be very costly. Um, and so if you're buying a house, as we say, there could be tens of thousands of dollars of hidden issues underneath the ground. And if we do a sewer scope, this is just one way for us to be able to say, okay, here you go. Here's what we got going on. And, um, and are you comfortable with having this repair in the future? So moving on, um, if you don't know how to do something yourself, don't do it. I think, I think it's just about that simple. If you don't know how to do it, don't do it. If you think you know how to do it, and you aren't 100% sure, just don't do it. That, that's all there is to it. So um, right here, the, how, how do you know this was not done by a professional? Well, most professionals don't leave their tools at their workspace months, years later. And so this right here, this, this pickaxe was basically used to dig down the ground. Okay, so there, there's an idea of disturbed and undisturbed soil. And whenever you start to dig, it becomes disturbed soil. Now, if we had to, you know, do do a quick pop quiz, um, the question would be is, what can support more weight in, uh, in a more controlled, understandable, and consistent manner? Undisturbed or disturbed? And the answer is undisturbed. So if you, if you want uh, a foundation, then you wanna make sure that you either do a proper uh, tamping schedule where basically based off of however many inches of dirt that you put, you are, you are tamping down those levels to basically bring that strength back into that uh, into that substrate. Um, so that is a, an option. 
um, or you can just leave the dirt alone or, or whatever it may be, or you can get down to bedrock. Um, but whenever you have undisturbed soil, that soil is about as supportive as it can possibly be. But as soon as you start digging around and aerating the soil, well, then you have some problems. So not only did they dig around and dig a hole, but then they, they started to install a couple of things. And if you take a look at these things that have been installed, um, one of the things that might catch your eye is that none of them are plumb. None of them are straight up and down. Um, and, and that would be straight up and down this way, and then also straight up and down this way. And so because of that, um, that's obviously bad. Okay, that's, that's only part of it. If you look at where those circles are, they were never anchored to the ground. So they, they were never on the pieces of wood that they were put on, they weren't nailed or screwed into the pieces of wood that they were on. Um, the wood that was there was never uh, attached to the ground with any kind of meaningful uh, method. And so what will happen here is, first off, my question is, why is it that they decided to install this in the house in the first place? Were they having um, bouncy floors where whenever they're walking on the floor, the floor is bouncing because you are overspanned uh, on some of these things? Did they did they do some modifications to the house that maybe they probably shouldn't have? Well, obviously here it's, it's clear that they did. But then, um, okay, so we put these pieces of wood in and are they actually supporting things the way that they should? Because sometimes when, whenever you talk about engineering, one of the issues that you can have is that if you create a lot of strength right here, then down the line, there may be a point where there is movement. And at that point, it might break because you added this here because the movement was maybe designed to move in a certain way. But because you isolated that movement, now any movement that is done is amplified and will break somewhere else. So this is not an engineered solution. This is not the way that it's supposed to be. And, and my concerns are, who did it? Why did they do it? And what can we do to make it correct? Because right now it is definitely not correct. All right. We've talked enough times about Federal Pacific. If you have Federal Pacific, just get it replaced. Just get it replaced. There's no reason. I mean, the manufacturers say that every 50 years, you should just put in brand new breakers, brand new service panel, brand new everything. The wiring can stay, but we want that service panel uh, and all the breakers to be replaced. So if you have Federal Pacific, it's time for a replacement anyway. Not to mention the millions uh, or actually uh, billions of dollars of burned down homes and, and other issues like that. Just spend the thousand, spend the $2,000 and get an updated service panel. It's, it's just that simple. All right, so guardrail misses, uh, guardrail missing. So basically anytime that you are 30 inches or above, you need to have a guardrail. Now, again, we've had this conversation that if I'm grandpa and I come over to your house and I fall off of your 29 and a half inch tall deck and I break my hip, do you think I'm gonna turn to you and say, well, Jimmy, you know what? I broke my hip, but man, I'll tell you, it was only 29 and a half inch fall. I shouldn't have broken my hip. If it was 30 inches, I would have sued you, but your family, so 29 and a half inches, we're fine. Yeah, okay, sure, may maybe maybe your grandpa is gonna say that to you. So, but the reality is, is that your, your grandpa, regardless of whether he broke his hip, um, you know, falling from 29 and a half inches or falling from 30 inches, he still has a broken hip. So the way I look at it is, is that if, if there's something weird about that deck, if, if there's not a good way to fall off of that deck and it's at 28 inches, we're still gonna call it out. If it's at 29 inches, we're gonna call it out. If it's at 30 inches, we're gonna call it out. If it's at five inches, we're not gonna call it out. But if it's at five inches and there's all these punji sticks that are just like sticking up, ready for you to fall onto, then yeah, we'll call it out. But in general terms, um, we just wanna make sure that people are safe. And if they can be on a deck uh, and not have a risk of falling off and getting seriously hurt, then great. But the reality is just th think of yourself as a 90 year old version of yourself and would falling off of any height deck be an acceptable risk. So carpet and bathroom, don't do it. Bacteria, mold, a whole bunch of other issues. Just don't do it. Around that toilet, ugh, gross. No, just don't do it. No carpet in the bathroom, no thank you. All right, evidence of past water intrusion. So th this is pretty, pretty clear evidence right here. The problem is, is that we don't know, is there mold behind the wall? Is there not mold behind the wall? What caused that? Has it been fixed? Has it not been fixed? Is it a seasonal issue? Is it a non-seasonal issue? What's going on here? And so there's a lot going on that, um, that just makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable. This is definitely one of those things that you wanna inquire with seller, find out what's going on because once you've inquired with the seller, then you really need to make sure that, um, that you have a good plan moving forward to make sure you're taking care of any issue that there may be. All right, so on the dishwasher, um, there was some damage to the dishwasher and so all the steam comes out of this little vent right here and it appears as if it got um, right behind uh, some of the paint and because of that, now we have some peeling paint, which is no good. 
All right, furnace. Furnace burner assembly dirty. Yep, it's dirty. So what are you gonna do? I'm gonna clean it. Why are you gonna clean it? Well, because you don't wanna have anything burning that shouldn't be burning. You don't wanna have um, uh, like uh, carbon deposits and other things like that building up on your burners. So we can get rid of all that dust all that debris, all that we are going to make sure we're controlling where the fire burns, we're going to be controlling what the fire is burning, and we're going to prolong the life of our furnace. Super easy thing to do. You should do it whenever you change your filters, just uh, get any dust and dirt and stuff out. All right, efflorescence is present. So basically what will normally happen is that you have that main footer that is poured. Where that main footer is, there's a little bit of space and then they will put the wall on top of it. Well, normally between the, the, the footer and the wall, there's a little bit of a gap. Uh, and that gap is a pretty good place where we can have uh, water come in, depending on how they built the wall. Now, in general terms, is it unlikely, like is it uncommon to see um, some signs of water intrusion? No, it's not uncommon. Um, on this particular one, um, it's really not that big of a deal. Um, it's just one of those things that you still want to know that it exists because it's more than likely in this area um, just caused by seasonal spring runoff. And so spring runoff is whenever all that snow that we have melts all at once and then we get um, super saturated soils and then those super saturated soils are right up against concrete and then water is going to slowly permeate into that concrete and that's just life. So um, not that big of a deal, but just something you should be aware of. All right, here's another reason why I absolutely love, absolutely love our thermal cameras. So whenever we go through with the thermal cameras, not only are we checking all the ceilings, walls, floor, whatever it may be, but on this particular sink, it was not leaking um, at the time that I tested this sink. And directly underneath it are all these towels because this area is used as a rental property. And so, okay, um, so I did not see a leak. There was no leak, um, you know, and whenever, whenever we test it, we, we fill up the, uh, the sink basin all the way. Then we drain it. We wait for it to completely drain. Once we're done hearing that it's completely done draining, then we take our hand and we basically just feel on that pipe to make sure there's no leaks. There were no leaks, none at all. But whenever I came back later and I look underneath the sink with the three, six, uh, sorry, with the thermal camera, Whenever I look under the sink with the thermal camera, there it is, clear as day. There has been a leak from this drain line. And that is um, right here. That is that little like blue, uh, um, dark purple color that we see right there. That is water evaporating. So that is your delta T. That is the change in temperature. And there is a different temperature whenever water starts to evaporate. So um, then moving on, unit hot. This was an interesting unit. So basically what happened was um, this particular unit had a hot water baseboard distribution system. And that's awesome, super duper efficient, really, really big fan. Um, but the problem is, is that where they had all of their piping um, that they use to distribute that hot water, instead of putting it down the center of the hallways, instead of putting it into uh, a chase uh, or some area where they could then run ventilation through that area to cool down that space, they had it in an unventilated uh, space that goes directly up against um, the side of the unit. So whenever I got into that unit, um, what you can see here is the unit was 84 degrees out, uh, inside. The heat was turned off. You can see it was 42 degrees outside and that it was 84 degrees inside with zero heat. So why was it 84 degrees in there? Well, because the boiler system to run this, that, the other, whatever, all of that hot water is going through where you can see that super duper bright yellow section. And that was right up against uh, all of these units. So all of the units in that entire building had the exact same issue because the person that designed the building did not take into account um, the transfer of heat. So thermal conductivity, they did not think about what's happening whenever you put it right up against the wall. That wall basically becomes a radiator, which is why it was 84 degrees inside that room. So 84 degrees inside that room, we can see that the ceiling that may or may not be in direct contact with the piping. The ceiling was at 96.5 degrees. So this here is an issue. And having talked to the person that was buying the house, the previous owner, so on and so forth, it doesn't look like there's gonna be a resolution. It's just, that's gonna be what it is. And the HOA will not allow you to install um, circulation fans uh, in your units to be able to draw in fresh air. So that way you're not at 84 degrees. So uh, it's a little bit concerning, uh, a little bit more than a little bit concerning. And this is why a home inspection is great because beautiful condo, beautiful view, right there next to the ski resorts, wonderful. Problem is it was built or designed poorly. And because of that, we now have excessively hot um, rooms and a whole bunch of issues with the HOA uh, from all the documentation that, um, that I was privy to. So anyway, that's, that's interesting. Um, here we go again. So right there going down that main hallway uh, and you can see it clear as day, 96.5 degrees, super duper hot.
All right, not designed for a hot tub. So pretty please don't put a hot tub on a deck that's not designed for a hot tub. There's a lot of reasons why this deck is not designed for a hot tub, but it's not designed for a hot tub. And there was a hot tub on the deck and you step on the deck and the whole deck just wobbles back and forth and you feel like you're gonna die. Don't stand underneath it. Don't get on top of it. Just do the things that need done to make sure that things are done properly and safely. And oh my goodness. So moving on, active leak presence. So right here, Underneath um, the window, this is in a basement window, you can see we had a whole bunch of, uh, of um, moisture that was coming in. And basically what I think was happening was that there was no swale, meaning that, that the water, instead of going away from, the water was actually coming down towards. And because the water was coming down towards that window, um, I think that it just kind of jumped a little bit of that, uh, the windowsill and then went straight down into the wall cavity. And so because of that, we can see that there's, um, obviously uh some moisture there and um <laughs> i don't think this was done on purpose this this one I, I think was actually legitimate but i just i just had like a feeling and um and so you can see in the bottom in this in this picture right here you, what what this is right here is um basically a dresser that was put up against the wall and there was no physical damage there was no nothing but i, I just was like you know what i don't normally move furniture but I really want to move this piece of furniture. So I moved the piece of furniture, looked at it with the thermal camera, stuck in the moisture meter, and clear as day, um, we have a, a moisture intrusion issue. And so again, I don't think that they did this on purpose, um, unlike the other ones that we were talking about. This, I do believe, um, just happened to be the way that it was. But yeah, um, not great. Um, so that needs to be resolved. And that might be digging out that window well, and then once you dig out that window well, um, then either putting in proper drainage irrigation or just a swale that moves that water further away from that window. Um, and again, because whenever we get snow buildup, um, snow buildup just, it, it makes things so difficult. So next thing, stop trying to kill your home inspectors. Put the proper screws in there. They should be blunt. Again, we want, if this is a wire and this right here is a screw, we want that screw to hit the wire and push the wire backwards. We do not want the screw to hit the wire and then screw its way through the wire, becoming energized in an attempt to kill your home inspector. Please stop trying to kill us. There aren't enough of us to uh, to just throw us away like cannon fodder. So, all right, cracks in the CMU. So this particular house had some cracks that were visible on the outside. They had cracks that were visible on the inside. Um, and they actually had an entire structural engineer report talking about the cracks. Um, and so it was nice to find these things, inform people, and then for them to inform us of, oh yeah, we already knew about that. Here's the, uh, the engineer's uh, response to repair. That feels great. Um, so yeah, they already have an engineer that is aware of it, uh, aware of all of the issues that could be uh, inherent because of it, and so on and so forth. All right, post not centered on footing. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I see this. And and it's one of those things that it's like, with a little bit of, of pre-planning, all of this could have been avoided. The real issue isn't necessarily pre-planning. They are aware that this is where I want to put a footing, this is where I want to install stuff. But But the problem is, that in the in the area that we are in, you may uh, you know strike a string um, to give you the exact coordinate of where you need to be. Mark it with a little bit of um, spray paint, and then you take your auger if you can even auger in this area because of how much rock we have. And then you auger down. Well, the problem is the auger is going to hit into something and it's going to shift over to the side, um, and that's obviously you know not great because then they don't put the string back up to verify that they actually have the hole where it's supposed to be. So. They may not notice that the auger is moving over a little bit, and then we run into an issue like this. So this is just poor poor construction practices. That's all that it is. And so now we see that we have a, uh, a post that is not centered. It is very poorly supported um, and just not, not the way that it should be. So that is something that we want to get resolved, ideally. All right, supply line rubber. So um, I've been learning a lot more about supply lines, um, and rubber is still bad. Stainless steel isn't the end all be all. There's uh, one company, and I can't remember the name, but they're actually a rubber supply line. Um, but the real thing is, is that they are not cheap. They're very expensive. So technically you could have a rubber supply line, but the hose is like noticeable how much better it is. It is a commercial grade hose. Um, so these hoses, the, the brass fitting that is inside of there, not, not only do you have two different types of, um, you have two different types of metal. Um, and so then that right there can cause like a galvanic reaction, but also the way the metal is, it basically just sharpens it. And every time that that you see uh, that if we, if we take a look um, right at the top up here, so right at the top, right there, uh, above those, above those hoses, there are these two little canisters and those are anti-hammer canisters. And so basically 
what they do is whenever the water is flowing, 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 and then it's shut off, instead of the water hitting at the very end, what happens is, is that um, that absorbs some of that shock because a, a laundry machine is going to shut off the water very abruptly, and that can cause water hammer. Now, whenever that happens, the hose is moving back and forth. And so if I have a brass fitting that is non-compliant and I have a hose that is going like this, well, then you can assume that we're going to have the hose burst and then water is going to spray out. And that's going to be basically just what happens. Now, the stainless steel hoses are better because they don't allow as much of that movement. Um, but yeah, rubber hoses really do need to be replaced with a minimum of stainless steel. If you want to buy that high-end commercial grade rubber hose, more power to you. But the reason they're so good is because of how big the brass fittings are. Basically, these are just cheap brass fittings. Um, so again, stainless steel would be great. It's funny if they did half of, half of them in stainless steel. But if you can replace a hose, you can replace that. So protectant failing. Whenever I look at this, um, it's basically just a house that has not had any new stain or protectant put on it. And so what you're looking at is that you, you can get about five years out of stain and about 12 years out of paint. So five years out of stain, 12 years out of paint. Um, and what we have right here is a house that has not been stained in probably 10 years or more. Um, and so we really need to protect the wood because whenever you have a log cabin, the wood is your structure. And, um, and that could be very, very, very detrimental. Now, I think I'm not 100% sure, but I think this might have been just a, uh, a log cabin veneer. But either way, uh, where are you going to get your logs? And and what are you going to like installing it and all this kind of stuff? It's like just put some protectant on it and then you don't have to worry about replacing stuff in the future. So, all right, this says do not push. Why not? I don't understand what it's for. They didn't tell me what it's for. They just said do not push. Now, most of the time, if there's a sign that says not to do something or like that it's working perfectly fine, so don't worry, then I then I try it. But if it says do not push like this, um, then it could be hooked up to something that needs to be on all the time. So inquire with the seller, find out why it is that it is um, not supposed to be pushed. Because if you take ownership of the house and you just leave that on there for the next 20 years and it says do not push, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, just just figure out what it is. That's it's easy enough to do. So um, moving on. All right. On this deck, whenever you have hangers, you need to put nails in the holes. If if the steel strapping, if the steel hanger has holes, it should have a nail. If there's a hole, there should be a nail. That's the, the manufacturers make it about as simple as they can possibly make it. If there's a hole, put a nail in it. None of these had more than one, one nail in them. It's almost as if they said, okay, underpaid assistant who has no, no uh, construction uh, knowledge or background, I need you to put all these hangers here and then they did. And they just didn't know that they were supposed to do it. And because there were other sections that were perfectly fine. And so I almost wonder if they had the apprentice go do this while they did something else. And um, it's an easy fix, really, really easy fix. You just go and you put in nails. Um, so super, super simple. All right. So this right here, uh, abandoned 120 or 240 volt wiring. Um, is it energized? No, not right now. But if I flip a switch, would it be energized? I don't know. If I flip a breaker, would it be energized? I don't know. If somebody's doing repair work and they are like, oh, black and black, those should go together. And then they put it together. Is it, is it going to be energized? Yeah, it very well might be. So we just want to make sure that if there's abandoned wire that we know exactly what it is. All right. So right here, we had a well test fail. All right, so on this particular well, this well failed. And why did it fail? Well, because it started sucking up air instead of sucking up water. And so we ran out of water. And so whenever we have a well, we have the actual column where, where the well is dug, and that has a certain amount of volume in it. So basically, in your straw, if we go back to that straw example, and you put the straw into a glass, put your finger down, lift it up, and then you take from that straw, well, you're only going to get so much water. What we really need is that we need there to be a very good um, tributary or, or like system of water coming back in to, to recover that well. So for instance, if you're drinking a glass of water, then yeah, that's super easy. If you are drinking a milkshake, well, it can't really recover as quickly. And so sometimes you get air in the system. And so basically what we need to have is we need to have a good amount of water flowing back into that well. That's what we're looking for. And if we aren't getting that, well, then we need to do something uh, about that. We need to either have a water storage tank, like a cistern or something um, that we can take out, you know, one gallon per minute to fill up this 300 gallon tank. Um, so that way, whenever I need water, then I'm good to go. We got to 361 gallons of water, which is pretty sub substantial. But luckily, this well had a pump protection system that basically tests and uh, and can see whenever the pump is no longer um, 
pulling up water because then, then the impellers just spin freely and that changes the, the load uh, on the electrical system. Now the thing is we need there to be water because all of those um, impeller systems, the motor is normally lower down in the water and it requires water to flow past that impeller and then that basically improves the longevity because then the motor is not getting as hot. And so um, there needs to be water. So as soon as we either notice that we are starting to suck out air or whenever we have a system like this saying, oh, we're sucking out air, we're done, then the test is over and you have failed. So what if I fail? Do I do I need to like not have the house anymore? No, no, no. You can still have the house 100%. Um, you can still live there 100%. But if you're the type of person that wants to be running the, the irrigation while you're cleaning your car, while you're topping off your hot tub, while the kids are doing slip and slide in the backyard, while, um, while you're taking a bath with a nice glass of wine and reading a book in your 50 gallon bath while you're doing laundry and while you're running the dishes, then no, you don't have enough water. It's not going to happen. But if you're the type of person that comes up um, and all that you do, you don't really do laundry, you don't clean your car, you don't do any irrigation, you basically just come up on the weekends uh, to this you know cabin of yours and you might take a shower and you'll maybe you know clean some dishes. Okay, if that's what you do, then you have plenty of water. You don't even have to worry about it. But if you're a normal family, you got to think about how much water do I use on a daily basis? And what you can do is in the house that you're currently in, you can take a look at your water meter and take a look at that water meter and say, okay, this week, I just want to see how much water I'm, I'm using. And then if you come out where you're using a certain amount of, uh, of water and it's more than what we're able to produce here in that time period, well, then you know, huh, that's a lot of water. Um, or that's not enough water, and then you need to make changes appropriately, whether it be water storage tanks or whatever it may be. All right, cracked tiles. So if you have a cracked tile, um, that's because either um, the subfloor is flexing uh, or somebody put grout down and there's a gap where there should be some grout and the tile is flexing into there. Now, the thing that you might know about tile is it's not the most flexible material. And so what I mean by that is that if you try to flex tile, it's just going to crack. So either the mortar was not put down properly or um, the subfloor, there's a lot of bounce and movement, or it could be that it was put on concrete and that concrete shrank and then that moved um, the tile in a way that broke the tile. So a lot of things can happen like that. Um, so grout, sealant, and whatever it may be, anytime that we have a penetration in a shower, uh, we want to make sure we put either grout or sealant all around that. Uh, and the reason why is that we do not want water going back um, behind because then we're going to rot out the inside of that shower wall. So anytime that there's a penetration, we want to make sure that we do not allow water to go anywhere. Now, the thing about that is that it is possible that water could go somewhere. So we really want to get the water and do like a horseshoe shape and then leave the bottom open. And the reason we leave the bottom open is because if water does get back there, we want the water to be able to exit. It's not like we're spraying water up and into the hole. We just want to make sure there's enough space that water can exit if water does get back there. Um, that'd be the, the appropriate way to use either grout or sealant to take care of that. All right, water intrusion inactive on this window. So basically um, what happened is that it's possible that um, we have a bad seal of the window to the house. Could be that we have uh, a bad you know, trim on the exterior or more than likely it is that somebody left this window open during a rainstorm or a snow event. Uh, and the reason why is because they have in-floor radiant heat. The room is super duper hot. They like to sleep whenever it's colder. So what do you do? You crack open the window. Whenever you crack open the window and the wind is blowing, then the snow is gonna come into that room and then that is going to damage the wall. If that is the case, okay, then just get um, you know, a scraper, scrape off all that repaint it, retexture it, good to go, and close the window. Or um, or do nothing, but really what, what I'd love to see is have that scraped, uh, have them fix it, and, uh, and be good to go. And there are a couple other places where it looked like water came in. Now, is it possible that instead of having the window open that we do have that more major issue? Yes, it 100% is. And so then maybe you wanna keep it open for a little bit and monitor it. That might be a thing that you might wanna do as well. E either of those things would be totally appropriate. All right, so reverse polarity. So this right here, um, there, there's a lot of safety things um, about having reverse polarity, but basically what's going on is that somebody um, was supposed to put um, the black wire on the brass uh, and then the other one, uh, the white wire should have been on the silver and they just got that flipped around. And it happens all the time, happens to the best of us, but because that happened, uh, what we wanna make sure that we do is that we just get that flipped back because now every single receptacle all the way down is now incorrect. And so we want to make sure that we get it done correctly. Um, and the reason this is an issue is because um, it is possible 
that you might think that uh, that a circuit is turned off um, and then you go and do electrical work and you could shock yourself. It is possible that you might have a, an appliance or a device that in case of an electrical short or emergency, that it will then um, take all of that excess voltage and take it down the white uh, line um, and basically do its best to not shock the person using it. But now that we have that switch, instead of taking all of that and putting it down the white line, we've now actually effectively just energized that metal appliance. And so we really just want to make sure that we have our polarity the correct way because if we don't, uh, it's pretty bad. So uh, sewer scope, roots. So I um, thought I had more pictures of this, but I guess I, I did not put them in. So when, whenever we have roots in the sewer scope, the problem is it, what's really interesting is that trees can actually sense the vibration of, of flowing water. Um, and so their tree roots, uh, the vibration, they will, they will feel the vibration and then they will go towards the vibration and the tree roots will then grow. And so uh, whenever you have that, you'll get a big ball of tree roots where like maybe two or three little roots might be able to come into that pipe. But then once they have that two or three, then they continue to grow and they'll create a, a way that basically dams up that entire pipe. And whenever that pipe is dammed up, uh, then what happens is that the, of course you'll have a backup, but the tree will then feel as if it has a limitless amount of water. And that's great for the tree, really, really bad for you and for your uh, plumbing. And so, as stated before, whenever you have an issue like this, it, it can be very, very costly. Um, with this particular pipe, you can do a rotor rooter where basically it comes down and it, it uses a, a cutting blade to cut all those roots. Um, but sometimes whenever you have like a, a, a plastic, like a, like a PVC or an SDR35, you cannot use one of those rotary uh, cutting blades because it can damage that plastic. And so um, you just have to make sure you have the right tool for the job. But in this case, I think they're gonna be able to do that. And then what would happen is, that just on an annual basis, you would just have that rotor rooted just to make sure that we aren't getting any excessive growth and that things are going down the way they can. Because even if we have a slowdown of water, um, then we're gonna get a buildup of oils and soap scum and sludge and all this kind of stuff that's then gonna grab more solids and then have an impacted, um, impassable amount of just stuff inside of there. And that's gonna make repair either impossible or extremely difficult. So it's just one of those things that you wanna just keep on top of it. Um, so anyway, overall, um, I would say that that is the in-service training for today. I think um, that we covered a lot of topics. And if you have any questions about anything in particular, then just give us a call. Um, and you can call our office, 970-386-7830, um, or you can go to twomoosehomeinspections.com. You can use our online scheduler to schedule a home inspection. Uh, also, if you've already had an inspection from us, you can just go to your inspect uh, inspection dashboard and you'll be able to see your inspector's contact information there. Um, so yeah, sorry about the uh, the rant at the very beginning. It just, it really does uh, make me a little bit upset whenever somebody is saying that they're doing something for someone's safety and then they're just not. Um, I think that people's safety is paramount. It's number one. There's nothing more important than somebody else's safety and your own safety, obviously. Um, so anyway, if you have any questions, um, please contact Two Moose Home Inspections uh, and you can do that either by phone or online. And I'd like to say thank you very much for getting through this entire in-service training and we'll see you on the next one.